Popular speculation about flying saucers swirled in the 1940s after an airplane pilot reported seeing saucer-shaped objects in the sky. A recent Gallup poll revealed 41% of Americans believe space aliens from other planets have been visiting Earth in UFOs or unidentified flying objects. A poll in England showed more people there believe in space aliens than believe in God. So it's common today to find folks who interpret the Bible as primitive attempts to describe contact with extraterrestrials. And there are a number of new modern religious groups that incorporate space travelers in their official theology. So it's no surprise that many see the wheels of Ezekiel's Old Testament visions as flying saucers. And many believe that Moses' Ark of the Covenant was a two-way radio for communication with a spaceship commander who said he was Almighty God. However, those who try to put this spin on the biblical narrative are usually individuals who've only looked at a verse or two out of context, or who've never opened the Bible at all. Turning to scripture itself, we find convincing proof that these alien space interpretations are totally bogus and contrary to what the Bible actually says. Let's look at some concrete examples. Welcome to Bible Nook's worship service. Pastor David Reed has authored numerous books, served as a contributing editor of Dr. Walter Martin's Christian Research Journal, taught at Spurgeon's in London, and pastored Emmanuel Baptist Church in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He now provides these worship services for individuals at home and free to use by small groups and churches. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our service. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've provided for us your word, the Bible, to teach us and to instruct us and to guide us. And we thank you, Lord, for all the proof that your word is true, true history, true prophecy, and true instructions from you on how to live our lives successfully in this world and the hope for the next. We thank you for the blessing of going over these things this morning and the joy of raising our voices in praise to you. So we'll pray your blessing now on our service and all who join us. In Jesus' name, amen. The lyrics of our first hymn remind us of what Christ Jesus did for us in leaving heaven and coming to the earth. Thou didst leave thy throne. Let's lift our voices together in praise to God. Thy coming to victory. 
When the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray, he gave them the words that we now call the Lord's Prayer or the Our Father. And Christians have been reciting this prayer for 2,000 years now. Let's join our voices together as we repeat these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Bible Nook is a small ministry with an outreach that's much larger than you would expect. We pay Facebook and Google YouTube to boost our messages so that these messages of the gospel will reach a much wider audience. Our recent message on the signs of Christ's return, can you see the forest for the trees, has reached an audience now of more than a quarter million. More than a quarter million people have seen that thumbnail uh, speaking about Christ's return and inviting them to click on the video. And more than 50,000 have clicked on the video to, to watch it, many of them watching the complete message and hearing that gospel message. You can share in this outreach with your gift of support by visiting BibleNook.com and clicking the Donate button on the home page. Today's scripture reading is found in Exodus chapter 37, beginning with the first verse. Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide and a cubit and a half high. He overlaid it with pure gold, both inside and out, and made a gold molding around it. He cast four gold rings for it and fastened them to its four feet, with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then he made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. And he inserted the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry it. He made the atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. Then he made two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. He made one cherub on one end and the second cherub on the other. At the two ends, he made them of one piece with the cover. The cherubim had their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim faced each other, looking toward the cover. May the Lord add his blessing to our reading of his word. Now let's join together in singing, Now Thank We All Our God.
Popular speculation about flying saucers swirled in the 1940s after an airplane pilot reported seeing saucer-shaped objects in the sky. Books, magazines, and movies popularized the idea of visitors from outer space. A recent Gallup poll revealed that 41% of Americans believe space aliens from other planets have been visiting Earth in UFOs or unidentified flying objects. A poll in England showed more people there believe in space aliens than believe in God. And so it's common to find folks today who interpret the Bible as primitive attempts to describe contact with extraterrestrials. There are a number of new modern religious groups that incorporate space travelers in their official theology. So it's no surprise that many see the wheels of Ezekiel's Old Testament visions as flying saucers, and many believe that Moses' Ark of the Covenant was a two-way radio for communication with a spaceship commander who said he was Almighty God. However, those who try to put this spin on the biblical narrative are usually individuals who've only looked at a verse or two out of context or who've never opened the Bible at all. Turning to scripture itself, we find convincing proof that these space alien interpretations are totally bogus and contrary to what the Bible actually says. Let's look at some concrete examples. Some false teachers today claim that the wheels Ezekiel saw were flying saucers. Louis Farrakhan of the Nation of Islam reportedly quotes one of the group's early leaders as saying Ezekiel saw a mother ship. According to Wikipedia, Farrakhan said, quote, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told us of a giant mother plane that is made like the universe, spheres within spheres. White people call them unidentified flying objects, UFOs. Ezekiel in the Old Testament saw a wheel. And then he added, and I quote, it is a circular plane, and the Bible says that it never makes turns because its circular nature, it can stop and travel in all directions at speeds of thousands of miles per hour. The Nation of Islam sect teaches that a black Allah will come to earth aboard this mother ship and will wipe out the white race, the supposed cause of the world's troubles. After this visitor from the flying saucer destroys all the white people, the world will then enjoy peace and prosperity. This is just one example of how false religious teachers distort the meaning of Bible passages to fit their theories about UFOs. And it shows how they pin their hopes for salvation on visitors from outer space instead of on Christ crucified, risen, and coming again. But Ezekiel's wheels have to be taken completely out of context to make them look like flying saucers. There are actually four wheels in his vision that sit on the ground as supports of a four-wheeled carriage or vehicle, four wheels of a wagon or a chariot, or a four-wheeled portable throne of God. The wheels each sit on the ground at the four corners of the vehicle or chariot, and they lift up only in unison when lifting up the entire vehicle. Ezekiel starts out by saying in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1, In my thirtieth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kibar River, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. And then Ezekiel goes on to describe four strange-looking winged creatures in the vision, each one of the winged creatures next to an unusual wheel a wheel within a wheel. And in verse 15, he says, As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature. Notice that Ezekiel said the four wheels were on the ground, just as your automobile's wheels are on the ground. They are four wheels supporting a vehicle or structure above them, just as the four wheels of your car or truck support the chassis as Ezekiel will go on to describe. But first he adds this description in verse 16. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. 
They sparkled like topaz, and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creatures faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved, and when the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. Ezekiel then goes on to describe how the wheels supported a chassis that was like a heavenly chariot, a movable throne of God. Ezekiel 20, uh, 1 verse 21 says, The likeness of the firmament above the heads of the living creatures was like the color of an awesome crystal stretched out over their heads. That's in the New King James Version. And in the NET Bible, the same verse says, over the heads of the living beings was something like a platform, gr glittering awesomely like ice, stretched out over their heads. And then in verse 26, Ezekiel describes what was sitting on that platform, supported by the four wheels. He says, above the expanse over their heads was the likeness of a throne with the appearance of sapphire, and on the throne high above was a figure like that of a man. The chapter concludes with Ezekiel saying, such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So this was a vision of God on his throne, a movable throne with amazing wheels. So rather than looking like flying saucers, Ezekiel's wheels looked more like the wheels of a wagon, the four wheels of a vehicle a marvelous vehicle that can lift up off the ground, as we would expect of a movable throne of God. Only someone unfamiliar with the Bible account would identify Ezekiel's wheels with flying saucers, or someone seeking to, to deceive people and lead them away from the God of the Bible. Now what about the Ark of the Covenant? UFO enthusiasts claim that it was a radio allowing Moses to speak with alien spacecraft. The Ark has fascinated people for centuries. It's been the subject of artwork down through the ages. And it's even more mysterious because it seems to have disappeared before the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in the first century. The Roman Arch of Titus commemorating that event depicts the Roman legions carrying away artifacts from the temple, but not the Ark of the Covenant. It's not shown there. The Ark, the greatest treasure of all, is not depicted there, so the Romans didn't find it. Since that time, its whereabouts has always been a mystery. And Harrison Ford's Indiana Jones movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark, brought that mystery surrounding the Ark to modern day audiences. The movie is set in 1936 and has the U.S. government hiring archaeologist Indiana Jones to find the missing Ark before Adolf Hitler's Nazi agents find the Ark and use its supposed secret powers for evil ends. The movie made it a life or death matter of world importance. Now that Indiana Jones story was pure fiction, of course. But the false information about the Ark can actually be deadly in real life today. A life or death matter affecting people's eternal destiny. For example, a man in his early 50s contacted me looking to be mentored as a new Christian. He told me he had just come to believe in God and was seeking fellowship to build his faith. We began meeting together regularly. And whenever we got together, I encouraged him to read the Bible, read the New Testament, read the Gospels, so that he would get to know Jesus and hear from God firsthand through the pages of the Bible. He kept saying that he would, but instead he began reading material he found on the internet about UFOs and space aliens. Instead of reading what the Bible said about Moses, he read claims on the internet that the Ark of the Covenant was actually a radio given to Moses by aliens from outer space so they could speak to Moses. 
That meant Moses was hearing from space aliens rather than from Almighty God. I tried to get him to read about Moses in the Bible itself, but he was so captivated by the conspiracy theories and UFO stories that he kept pursuing them and didn't want to hear anything more about the Bible or the Gospel of Christ. Soon he no longer wanted to talk with me. He went back to atheistic unbelief, a victim of the devil's lies. You and I may encounter others like him, or you may be in that situation yourself, listening to this message right now in an attempt to arrive at the truth of the matter. So it's important to know what the true facts are about Moses and the Ark of the Covenant, proof that it was not a radio. Those who make that claim that it was a radio point to a Bible passage like Numbers 789, which says Moses heard God's voice coming from between the cherubs on top of the ark. It says when Moses entered the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him from between the two cherubim above the atonement cover on the Ark of the Covenant. In this way, the Lord spoke to him. Decades ago, when UFO enthusiasts first began promoting the idea of the Ark as a radio, you can see the resemblance to the radios used in those days. Couldn't the cherubs on top of the Ark have been some sort of antenna? Or couldn't the cherubs have been a speaker? Why not? Well, those who try to draw parallels between the Ark and early radios are missing the rest of the ingredients. Those early radios had not only antennas and speakers mounted on the top, but also the rest of the ingredients of a radio inside the box. But the Ark of the Covenant had no such ingredients. It was an empty box, except for the ingredients named in the Bible. Hebrews 9.4 says regarding the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant, this Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had been budded, and the stone tablets of the Covenant. And even some of those ingredients appear to have been removed over time, because after the time of Moses and the time of King Solomon, 1 Kings 8 verse 9 says, there was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the sons of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. There were none of the parts that would be needed to power and operate a radio. And that shouldn't surprise us, because Moses had no need for a radio. He was hearing from God and talking to God long before the Ark of the Covenant was built. God first spoke to Moses after catching his attention with a burning bush that was not burned up by the fire. Exodus 3 verse 2 tells us, Moses saw the bush ablaze with fire, but it was not consumed. So Moses thought, I must go over and see this marvelous sight. Why is the bush not burning up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, he answered. So no radio was needed for this two-way communication. Later, after Moses had returned to the land of Egypt, we read in Exodus 6, verse 28, Now on the day that the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I say to you. Again, no radio was needed or used, and this was long before the Ark of the Covenant was constructed. And during the following days, when God sent plagues on Egypt, the Almighty spoke to Moses repeatedly, again without the need for any physical device. And then after leading the Israelites out of Egypt and bringing them to Mount Sinai on the Arabian Peninsula, God told Moses he would speak in the hearing of all the people. At Exodus 19, verse 9, we read, The Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud, so that the people will hear me speaking with you, and will always put their trust in you. No radio has ever had the speakers or amplification 
to match that thundering voice of God that was heard by over half a million people. In fact, the experience was so overwhelming that the people told Moses at Deuteronomy 5.24, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his majesty, and we have heard his voice from the fire. Today, we have seen that a person can live even if God speaks with them. But now, why should we die? This great fire will consume us, and we will die if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. For what mortal has ever heard the voice of the living God speaking out of fire as we have and survived? Go near and listen to all that the Lord our God says. Then tell us whatever the Lord our God tells you. We will listen and obey. No radio could have conveyed that awesome experience of hearing the voice of God thunder from the flaming mountaintop. It was only after all of this that the Ark of the Covenant came into the picture. Where did the Ark of the Covenant come from? Was it given to Moses by space aliens? No, the historical record is very clear. It says that it was built by a man, and its design was very simple, with none of the electronics needed for a radio. Exodus 37 records the details of how it was built by an Israeli craftsman named Bezalel. It says, Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. He overlaid it with pure gold, both inside and out, and made a gold molding around it. It goes on to tell how Bezalel carved two angels called cherubs and put them on top of the cover, but nothing was inside the ark. It was an empty box. After it was built, the only things placed inside it were, as we read a moment ago, the walking stick belonging to Moses' brother Aaron, a pot of manna, and the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments. So there's no way that that box, that empty box, could have been a radio given to Moses by space aliens. Susceptible people mistakenly place their hopes in space aliens instead of placing their hope in Christ. They look for salvation from a source other than Christ, crucified, risen, and coming again. The UFO teachings are just one more lie raised up against the truth of the gospel. The Apostle Peter says at 1 Peter 3.15 that we should be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And that's why we've responded to the false claim that the Ark of the Covenant was a radio. Will governments and news media and popular opinion make even more false claims about UFO sightings and claimed contact with aliens? We don't know. But amidst all of the deception going around in the world today, our protection is to know the scriptures, to know what the word of God actually says, and to know and follow our living Lord Jesus. People around us may eagerly hope for space aliens to reveal themselves and save our planet, but we will not be deceived. Based on all the solid evidence we have from the scriptures, from history, from archaeology, and from the creation around us, our hope is in Christ, for his kingdom to come, and for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We won't let speculation and false reports about UFOs turn us away from our true hope, which is Christ, crucified, risen, and coming again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of the matter on the Ark of the Covenant and the truth of the matter on Ezekiel's wheels. We thank you, Lord, that you've preserved the Bible and made it available for all of us to read so that we can verify what's true and identify what's false and not be misled. We thank you, Lord, that you've presented this material in the scriptures and preserved the Bible down through the centuries so that we can read it today. We thank you for this treasure you've given us in your word, and we pray that you'll help each of us to take it into our hearts, 
to grow in faith and to share that message with others. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join together now in singing Down at the Cross Where My Savior Died. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name, glory to his name. Saved from sin, Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where He took me in, glory to His name, glory to His name, glory to His name. There to my heart was a blood. Precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was a blood of Sweet, cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was a blood applied. Glory to His name. Heavenly Father, thank you for calling us aside from the troubles and problems of this world to listen to your word, to hear your voice through the Bible. We thank you, Lord, that we can speak to you in prayer and hear you speak to us today. And we pray, Lord, that you'll help us to keep you in our sights as we go about our business throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsel, God uphold you with his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet. Jesus' feet till we meet till we